was wondering, Joe. I don't know if it's possible. <sighs> but, uh, I need money. And, uh, but just to buy back my RV. You know, you know, me, me and Lou, it's, it's where we live. It's our home. Oh. And I can, I can totally pay you back. Just, uh, now, I've got an issue with time. Ruben, I don't understand the situation that you've put yourself in. But, from where I'm sitting, you look and sound like an addict. Oh, no, no. Yo, no. It's not, it's not, a, not an addict. It's fine, okay? My situation, it's cool, okay? That is a clip from Sound of Metal. I'm delighted to say we've been joined by Riz Ahmed. Uh, I don't know, wh where are you, Riz? I'm in LA right now. I was just uh, shooting in all around California and we ended up here and um, yeah, kind of doing press and stuff from out here. And pr promoting a movie, I th did you film this back in 2018? I mean, it seems like a long, long time ago. I did, yeah, and it's crazy. I mean, we premiered at Toronto in uh, September of 2018. 19 it's now start 2021 but covid just pushed everything back yeah before I, I don't want to run out of time to mention this at the end of our uh, uh, allotted schedule but the movie we haven't spoken since city of tiny lights which is 2016 but the long goodbye the movie that you made last year uh, about kind of nightmarish paramilitary britain and the effect that it has on um so asian british asian families you managed to say more in that 11 minute movie than so many movies say in two and a half, three hours. I thought it was extraordinary. I just wanted to say that at the, at the beginning. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, Anil Cario, who directed that, is just an exceptional talent. He was super collaborative. And I guess we wanted to find a way of bringing the album and the, the story and the message of the album to, to life um, in a way that simultaneously felt very grounded and realistic, but also uh, entered the realm of dreams or rather nightmares. Yeah. Anyway, and, and it's up there. If people haven't seen it, you, uh, you, can, you can see it. It's, it's very easily available. Anyway, that's that. That's 2020. Here we are, 2021. Sound of Metal, moving from 2018. Uh, tell us about Ruben. Tell us about this, uh, this extraordinary film that you've done here, Riz. Oh, thank you. I mean, um, it, it did feel extraordinary, you know, even from the first moment I read the script. Darius Marder, the writer-director, who's worked on Blue Valentine and Place Beyond the Pines, he just brought that same kind of authenticity, emotional nuance, heartbreak, bit of sweetness to this script. And it was also set in such a specific world, the world of punk noise metal bands and the world of the deaf community. And not just the deaf community, but, um, you know, addiction recovery circles set in the deaf community. And it was just eye opening to me. So when I met him and we really connected, um, I was ready to do it. And then he told me that whoever plays the role has to really play the drums on camera and has to really learn sign language so he can improvise with deaf actors. And that gave me pause for a second, but then I just realized that it would be the most unique experience, you know, and I, I jumped in head first. So you play, I mean, just, just, just to set it up, you play this drummer, Ruben Stone, you're in a band. Are they called Black Gammon? Is that is that the right name of the band? That's right. Yeah, it's a kind of playful pun, and, and there is a kind of humor and playfulness to 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 the character and to their relationship. So Ruben and Lou, they live together um, in an RV. They tour America. They're constantly on the go, and they're in a band together in a relationship. They're recording together. They live in this kind of little bubble. They get to control and keep the outside world at bay. Um, and then suddenly, Ruben loses his hearing uh, very very suddenly. And with that, his whole life is turned upside down. He stands to potentially lose his relationship, um, which is premised on them being in a band together, his art, his obsession, his touring lifestyle. And he's forced to um, actually kind of look within and deal with some of those addiction demons that start bubbling up uh, in the wake of this trauma. So it's very much a, a kind of intense journey of facing yourself. And it, it, it's worth saying just in passing that in this Amer American punk metal band, Olivia Cook, your partner from Oldham, Riz Ahmed from Wembley. There you go, and, uh, and making some very good American metal. Um, so just on the, on the two different aspects of it, the drumming 
first of all, had you, obviously you've been immersed in music for, for a long time. You must have a rhythm and a general musical sense, even if you, even if you don't play the drums until now, how difficult was it? Well, I, yeah, I did have a sense of rhythm from being a rapper, but I definitely was not able to coordinate all four limbs at different tempos, you know, playing the drums. It's a di very different kind of brain wiring you need to develop and you can't rush it. You know, it is really about programming and rewiring your brain. And my drum uh, teacher, Guy Licata, always said, you can't play the drums. You have to let them play you. You have to kind of surrender to them, you know, um, and it's something it's something about the drums is, is like a mirror. You know, the way you play the drums is the way you do everything. If you don't hit them hard enough, you, you know, you hit them too hard, you grip your sticks too tight, you try and control or anticipate the rhythm or you're a little bit lagging behind it. It's, it's, it's kind of like facing yourself playing the drums. So it was challenging, um, but I found that towards the end, the biggest issue I had was not wobbling my jaw around like a metronome to keep time with the beat. Um, I'd been doing that for seven months. The day before shooting, someone pointed that out. So my biggest focus on the day of filming was to try and keep my face from gurning. Um, well, we absolutely, and when we when we see the live concert footage, we absolutely believe that you're the drummer. We, we I think we can tell instinctively that you are drumming. We can tell that Olivia is singing. And that actually is kind of crucial because although you don't spend a lot of time at, at the gig in, uh, in the movie, we're invested in you right from the very beginning that you are a drunk so when you go deaf we believe that you go deaf but those live that live concert footage is extraordinary and at the heart of really what comes next i think yeah well darius just um who believe it or not is a first time director and he's got such a kind of precise vision for this film um from the way it's shot all the way through to the sound design which we can talk about but he was he was really adamant that everything was authentic and for real so that's why he really wanted me to play drums really wanted olivia playing guitar really wanted deaf uh, you know actors and us improvising in sign language and he wanted us to shoot in order as well chronologically so we were really living through the experience which kind of invited us all to kind of you know even though we're british actors um step into a kind of method process you know to to just kind of live in these characters for that seven months of preparation and you know those those five weeks of filming so um everything that darius has kind of done is grounds it in an authenticity all the way through to to the sound design tell us about the experience of learning what i believe is american sign language that you're that you're speaking here what what that was like and how difficult it was to to get in the impact that it had on you it was challenging but i would say that i wouldn't actually describe it as difficult because it was just so enriching the benefits so outweigh the costs and the, the benefits of learning American sign language for me weren't just learning this language and being able to connect with deaf people, which was so joyous and so enriching in itself. I also feel like my sign instructor, Jeremy Stone, who I went on to name the character after and naming him Ruben Stone, I feel like he taught me the true meaning of listening. You know, the deaf community taught me what it means to listen. It's not something you just do with your ears, it's something you do with your whole body. And at different points in the film, when I was using audio blockers, uh, emitting a white noise setting, you know, deep in my ear canal to the point where I couldn't hear myself or anyone else, I did find myself forced to listen with my whole body, to be more present, more attentive. And in many ways, I feel like deaf people are the best listeners, you know. It, it also had a, an impact on me, I think, physically as an actor and a performer, being forced to communicate with my whole body you know, Jeremy told me that there's a trope in the deaf community where people think of hearing people like us as emotionally repressed because we hide behind words. Mm. And actually, I found that to be true insofar as when I was expressing myself about emotional things in American Sign Language, I'd find myself tearing up. Whereas, you know, if I was just using words, I could just glide over the subject. You're just forced to connect in a more visceral, embodied way with what you're saying. So stepping into deaf culture taught me about communication, taught me about listening. Um, it was an amazing process, and and I think we all need to realize that deafness isn't actually a disability; it's a culture, and a culture we can learn so much from. Having said that, this movie was a couple of years ago. Has it stayed with you? Do you still find as though you listen and communicate in a different way, having done this film? I hope so. I think that you know part of the the magic and the mystery of this profession is that it changes you in ways you might not even realize. You know, and and those experiences kind of stay with you. I remember actually Tom Hardy once saying to me that, you know, every actor starts off with no sense of self. And ideally you end up with a universal sense of self. 
from inhabiting so many different points of view, which I thought was really astute. And, and I guess like, you know, along this journey, you play a character like Rubin or play a character like in the long goodbye and you kind of, they, they add to you in ways you might not fully understand, but I think you do kind of carry with you going forward. What Ruben does as he loses his hearing, he's absolutely determined to get uh, implants, to get some kind of hearing back. Can you just explain why that's considered such a controversial thing? You talked about the deaf community. There's, there'll be differing uh, opinions on that. Why is it so controversial? Yeah, so there's this idea of deaf pride, and you can write deaf with a small d or with a capital D. When you write it with a capital D, it's deafness as an identity, as a culture, not a disability, not as an impairment. You know, many deaf people now will say, well, I'm not impaired. You're the impaired person. You don't speak sign language. So it's this kind of flip, which is very empowering based on this concept of deaf pride, whereby you have to respect deafness as just a way of being. It's another way of being in the world. It's as valid as being a hearing person. And as such, attempts to fix your deafness biologically with surgery and cochlear implant surgery can, can be controversial. You know, I know many deaf parents agonize over whether or not to kind of give their kids um, CI surgery, um, which is most effective when you do it within the first two years of life. It may give them hearing, but also deprive them from being truly embedded in the richness of deaf culture. And this is often many people are deaf over multiple generations. And having gained a tiny glimpse into deafness, I can also attest to the fact that it is a different culture, you know, it, 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 that has its own values and yeah. it's its own way of being. I think hearing culture is more individualistic and deaf culture, you know, given that people have to rely on each other to get by in a hearing world, is much more collectivist. There's actually this joke where if you want a secret to get out, tell a deaf person because there's such a need and a desire to communicate that, you know, your secret will get out if you tell a deaf person. Yeah. And it's worth saying part of the, you talked about the sound design, but one of the experiences people will have watching this movie, Riz, is that it's captioned. It's, it has subtitled. Clearly, mm -hmm. that was a decision that was made very early on. What do you, what do you make of that? And what do you think people will, will think about that? I mean, obviously, they'll understand why. Yeah, I think it's a really bold decision. I think to make a film that takes us into the deaf community without allowing deaf audiences to be on that journey with us from the beginning would be disrespectful and wrong-headed. I also think that it's, um, it's, it kind of begs a question, why aren't more films open captioned? You know, closed caption is when you can turn them on and off. Open caption is when it's burned into the film. And, and I think actually one of the saddest things about the pandemic for us on this film has been that we've been deprived of those screenings where deaf and hearing audiences are sitting side by side watching the film that happened at Toronto Film Festival, happened at multiple screenings just before lockdowns started. And that was really unique. That's something that you never really get. You know, deaf people often can't go to the cinema at all, you know, because it doesn't cater to their needs. So having those audiences experience side by side, hearing how some sections of the film, you just hear deaf, the deaf audiences laugh <laughs> or gasp. You know, that, that was, um, that was kind of amazing. And, and uh, I hope actually once things open up again, we'll still be able to screen this film just for that, just to, to convene those gatherings and those conversations that came out of those screenings. And, and it's worth saying, Riz, just, just before we go, that Mogul Mowgli is, is on its way. You've written that, you starred in it. And again, you're a musician, you're a rapper, illness. I haven't seen, I haven't seen the movie, but is it just coincidence that these things have come along at the same time? Well, it's interesting because, you know, we were writing and developing Mogul Mowgli, you know, the, my co-writer and director, Basam Tariq and I, for quite some time when Sound of Metal came along. And I was aware of the fact that there were some overlaps thematically, but I knew they both had such distinctive visions that actually, that's the joy of cinema is you can take two subject matters that look so similar on paper, but with different directors, different visions, different musical and, you know, uh, a, a kind of treatment to it and, and, and a different eye on these stories, they can feel so different. And, and, and in a strange way, I think you could watch both films and almost forget what those, you know, how similar they might sound on paper because they are so distinctive. But I was really interested in the time, I think, with this idea of, you know, what is the point of what we do as artists? Is it just ego? Is it just running away from our demons? Or is it about confronting your pain and in confronting your pain, hopefully healing others of theirs? And I think I just come off a run of doing lots of kind of bigger films. And you know, after doing 10 years of indie films where I was pretty clear about what I was doing and why I suddenly started doing these bigger Hollywood things that left me kind of wondering what I'm doing, you know, is this, is this an art or is this a business and where's my place in it? And so I guess I wanted to tackle some films that really confronted those questions head on. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Riz, it's always fascinating to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you so much, man.